Hello and welcome to RF Design Tutorials. This is tutorial 25 on CPWG based designs in ADS. And in this tutorial, we will take a case study of CPWG based power divider design. Here is the agenda for this tutorial. A lot of interesting topic. We will start with something basics and make our way through to a complete assembly level simulation for CPWG power divider along with SMA connector. So a lot of interesting content. I hope you will stay till the end of this video. Now before we start, as always, don't forget one, two, three. Subscribe to the channel, enable all the notifications and give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and colleagues. All right, so let's get started. Let's talk about some of the very basic of CPW, which I'm sure you're already aware of, but it's always good to revise some of the key fundamentals. Now in a conventional CPW line, uh, you will have one central conductor, you know, uh, printed on one side of the dielectric and a pair of the crown conductor, one on the either side. And with these three uh, conductors being printed on the same side of the dielectric, the term is coplanar. And that's why we refer to that as a coplanar waveguide line. Now the return between the center conductor and the ground conductor will control the impedance requirements and it will exhibit a particular impedance for the line which you're trying to create. In another alternation format, you have a conductor backed coplanar waveguide, also known as coplanar waveguide with crown, or what we commonly refer as CPWG, where we do have the backside of the dielectric also uh, with conductor, and the top ground and the bottom grounds are connected through the plated you know, through holes or the via holes as we call it. And that conductor will serve as a third return conductor. Now for all practical purpose, CPWG is the more common technology which we use for RF microwave designs, especially at the millimeter wave frequency range. Now, if you compare microstip and CPWG line, uh, both technologies have their pros and cons. Um, but CPWG technology is rather preferred if you're dealing with um, the high frequency circuits such as on millimeter wave, because it will have a comparatively less radiation loss, uh, which microstep will suffer from. And also the mode separation will be moderate as compared to the microstep. Also in terms of bandwidth, uh, CPWG lines basic structure have a capability to do a wider bandwidth compared to microstrip. However, one thing which works out very favorably to microstrip is the performance of microstrip circuit is less sensitive to the PCB fabrication tolerances. Whereas in case of CPWG, you need to be careful about those tolerances. Now the key and the key to understand the difference between microstrip and a grounded CPW is looking at the fields. In microstrip, most fields are between signal plane and the ground plane and the high field concentration will be there at the conductor edges. And that's what we learned all the way in our theory. And that's how when we perform EM simulation, we are more concerned about the edges being meshed properly. In grounded CPW, there will be strong field coupling between or strong field between the ground signal ground or the coplanar layer on the top of the substrate. And there will be less fields between the signal planes and the bottom ground plane compared to microstrip. Now, CP, grounded CPW can be operated upon in two configuration, tightly coupled, where you keep the distance between the central conductor and the ground planes uh, alongside to be small. And tightly coupled grounded CPW will have slightly more conductor loss, but it is less susceptible for the radiation loss, always preferable at higher frequency where your wavelength becomes a smaller and you don't want to suffer from the radiation um, in, the, in the circuit which you're designing for. Also, those kind of lines will allow better suppression of spurious modes. When you work with loosely coupled grounded CPW lines, you pull this ground far away from the center conductor and you, you reorient the fields so that the, the distribution between the top side fields and from the top plane to bottom plane actually gets a little different compared to the tightly coupled line. But for all practical purpose, we typically uh, prefer to work with tightly coupled 
grounded CPW lines, but as a designer, it's your choice. All right, so enough of basics and fundamentals. Let's go ahead and talk about how do we approach CPWG based single section power divider design, and we will look at more advanced cases as we go along. Now, how do we start uh, designing a CPWG based power divider? Well, the design process remains exactly the same as we discussed in the last video where I talked about micro step power divider design. So using line calc, uh, which has the capability to do micro step line calculations, here you can see the same tool is also uh, gives us capability to do CPWG based design. And here I have entered my dielectric specification, which is 30 mil. 4.6 dielectric constant, and I'm doing my calculation at 2.4 gigahertz. Now, once we enter the electrical parameter and try to synthesize the physical properties of the line, we do have two choices here. One, we can keep the crown distance fixed and then calculate the resulting width of the transmission line to achieve the specific impedance we are looking at or alternatively, you can fix the width of the line and then calculate the spacing of the ground. It's all about maintaining the distance between signal and ground, very much like micro strip. If you want to achieve, uh, let's say a specific impedance, you can either change the height of the dielectric, keeping the width constant, or once you fix the substrate height, you can change the width to achieve any impedance. Now, good design practice when you deal with CPWG kind of a structure is in your entire structure, you keep the crown constant. It simplifies your design process as well as uh, makes your layout chop very, very easy. And that's what you're going to see in this video. And that's what I'm going to talk about. There is no logical reason why you need to play with crown separation and you can simply live by calculating the width for a fixed amount of crown or the fixed crown distance throughout uh, your structure. Now in this case, for a 50 ohm line over this uh, dielectric, I can calculate for the ground separation of 0.5, which by the way, is less than the height of my dielectric. And this I have done deliberately to make sure the coplanar grounds are closer to my conductor to ensure good signal um, energy field around the top plane and avoid more fields uh, from top plane to bottom plane. Now with that constraint set, I do have my width, which is 1.2 mm for a 50 ohm line. Similarly, uh, like I know for two way power divider, I need another section with 70.7 ohm. I can enter that you know number here and the ground is fixed and it calculates me uh, the width of the line required which is around 0.6 mm. So now I have the physical parameters which I need in order to proceed with my power divider design. And a 90 ohm, uh, you know, electrical or 90 degree electrical length corresponds to around 18 mm in physical length. Now I have all the properties which I need. So now we can proceed to the layout design exactly like how we talked about in micro step power divider video. So with that video, I am sure you have the fundamentals in place to come up with a structure which looks like uh, what you're seeing on the screen. Now here, the 50 ohm line, which I have, if I double click, you can see it's 1.2 mm and I kept 2.5 mm uh, for the length so that I can mount the SMA connector when we fabricate the PCB. Similarly, uh, the trace on the output size is 50 ohm. And if you take a look at the width, it's around 1.2 mm for both of these tracks. So they are 50 ohm line as well. Now here in the center, we do have 70.7 ohm, 90 degree length line. And here you can see I have used the trace of 0.6 mm and the length is around 18 mm, which is exactly what we wanted. And we do have a couple of ports for the resistor mounting. Now, when you deal with CPW, there are many ways you can deal with this resistor. One way is to keep enough separation between these two lines so that the 0.5 mm ground separation, which we selected, uh, this gap is able to honor that. If this gap is too close, you might not get any ground in between, and that is fine as well. Or like last time, what we used in micro strip uh, video, 
we could have an inductor or the resistor pad between those two ports. So there are various ways of doing things. It's up to you. Here I have ensured sufficient distance between these two points so that I can fit in the crown in between here. Now once we have the basic structure in place, we can put the crown and the connecting via holes to the bottom ground. Now first, let's take a look at the stack up. So there are a couple of stack ups I'm going to deal in this video. In the first stack up, I use something similar to what you will do if you're dealing with multi-layer PCB technology, where you have conductor on the top and the crown on the second layer. And both of these um, you know, conductors will be connected by a whole layer in the layout for making the crown connections. So that's one way of doing it. When you deal with this way, you need to make sure you draw the crown shape or the rectangle or polygon in the second layer so that you can have the crown reference. The alternate way is how we keep on doing things traditionally, and it is by using an ideal cover plate to act as a crown. And again, I do have a hole uh, to connect the bottom and the top crown. Now, if you're, even if you're dealing with multi-layer designs, you can easily do it by using an ideal ground to start with. And once you finalize your design, you can replace it with the ground I showed you just now with having some finite conductivity. So we will use this for my first test case uh, instead of using this. So this one I would use when I assemble my SMA connectors. And you can see I'm using a bounding area layer to limit the size of the dielectric and so on. So we will shortly talk about this as we go along. Now, once I have this um, basic structure in place, we can simply insert plane uh, from the insert menu. And clearance here would be 0.5 because this is what I used while calculating the, the CPWG line dimension. I can also enable some smoothing options so that I can avoid some acute angles or a smaller feature size below a certain limit. So in my case, I will enter something like 0.2 mm. I don't want to see anything which is less than 0.2 mm. And I'm going to draw a rectangle. Now, depending upon how your topology is for the power divider, uh, which you ended up designing, you can make those selections. So here, my job is kind of pretty simple. I can click here and now I have the crown plane drawn. And one of the property of this crown plane, if you click on it, and if you're looking on the properties window, uh, you can see it's a crown plane and the net name is GND exclamation. That's the internal keyword which ADS will use for a default crown net. So anything which you want to associate with ground, you can always name them as GND exclamation. Now, the next step is to draw the via holes. Now for via holes, I'm going to use the hole layer. This is what I used in my stack up. And I will draw a small circle without worrying about the radius or anything. I'll just draw a circle. And now once I click on the circle under properties window, I can see the radius. And now I can define the radius as I want. In this case, I'm treating it as, or defining it as 0.3 mm. So I have a 0.6 mm diameter hole. And once I have one basic hole, I can go to edit, copy paste, step and repeat. And I now can create an array of the via, as you can see. So I have one via array and I can go and increase the number of rows to nine, for example. Now I can place a via array uh, pretty much like what you're seeing now. The other way is to define number of rows to three and maybe columns to seven. And I can start placing some of these via holes as we require uh, at the desired places. And again, you don't need to overdo this ground via placement. And any via which is coming out of the structure, etc., we can always deal with it later. And we can delete anything which is not required or not appropriate for other you know, kind of designs. Now the only thing remaining is to place some via holes at the center. So I'll go and define a number of rows to three and or number of rows uh, to seven and columns to three. And I can apply and I can add that, not 73, three. And as you can see with seven, it's going out. So I'm going to re you know, reduce the number of rows to six and then I'm going to place this. So nothing complicated, it's kind of pretty simple. 
Now again, any outliers which you have in your design, you can always go ahead and delete uh, some of those unwanted via holes. So it doesn't take too much of time and it's very easy to do. All right, so I can take one of this uh, row and I can put them here so that I have a good uh, via stitching at the connector launch point, which is always preferable. And then we are going to delete whatever we don't need and then adjust a little bit some of the things which are actually on the boundary and then pull them up, you know, inside a little bit. So that's about it. So it doesn't take too much of time. If you want, you can put additional holes here and here as you may require. And simply, you know, doing copy and paste uh, will help you uh, place as many via holes at, at different location which you might be uh, needing it. All right, so once this is done, you can see all uh, net overlap zone is being identified by ADS because these vias are not yet the ground net. So you can click on any of the one via and now if you zoom in, you will see this blue conductor. Click on that blue conductor. It will ask you to merge these two nets. Go ahead and merge. And now you can see the overlapping zone uh, from all the vias have gone. And now all of them have become the ground net vias. Now, uh, once we are ready to simulate, we need to think about where will be my return path? And some people have confusion where to keep the crown at the bottom, or should I use the crown on the sides of this conductor? Now, if you're defining a tightly coupled CPW line, especially when your crown separation is less than the height of your dielectric, which is basically the vertical distance between signal and ground, Obviously, you have to do G, S, G kind of configuration, which is ground signal ground configuration. And that means I can take a pin and I can attach the pin on the edge of this ground alongside the signal conductor. Now, here is a trick uh, which you will need to use if you're placing the, the pin on the edge of this line. Now, remember, these are all point pins. If you place it, the pin on this huge wide edge, you will have simulation errors of warnings coming up in your status window when you run an electromagnetic simulation. To avoid this, you can use two methods. One, you can keep the pin slightly inside the conductor. Don't place it directly on the edge, but otherwise the current has to distribute itself to such a wide edge which you're placing it on. Or use the shape as edge instead of dot. So that's the default which you will get and you can use a edge pin and define the length of the edge which you want to restrict your port excitation to. So in my case, I use 0.5 and now I can zoom in and I can place one pin on that side, uh, which was pin number six and P7 is on this side. So now I have two crown reference pin for my signal port and I will make it appear to form GSG configuration. Similarly, on the other side, I'm going to place two more pins, uh, one on this side and another on this side, which is going to be pin number eight and nine. Now for pin number 10 and 11, they will be with port of pin number three, which will be my third termination. So now I have all the pins which I require for my CPWG based design. We can go ahead and make the port pairing. So by opening the port editor, I can see all the pins here. So the first thing which I'm going to do is put them side by side, switch off the auto center so that, um, you know, the, when I make a selection, this doesn't zoom into one specific location. So when I click on one port here, you can see in the properties, it is P6, which has to be associated with port number one. So I can take this P6, drag and drop it to GND, because if you leave it GND, it will refer to the bottom uh, cover plate for your crown, which is what I don't need. Pin number seven, which is on this side of your signal pin one, I can drag and drop that again there. So now with port number one or termination number one, you have a GSG configuration. This is the most optimum and accurate way of simulating the CPWG. Now for port number two or termination number two, I can take pin number eight, drag and drop, pin number nine, drag and drop. And now once I click on termination two, you can see the pairing there. Now, finally, for port number three, termination three, I will take P10, drag and drop, P11, drag and drop, 
and I also have my third coplanar port. Now for the resistor, which is basically this port number, uh, pin number P4 and P5, I drag and drop, make them appear, and instead of using 50 ohm, I'm going to attach a 100 ohm resistor between them. Now with the, all these tricks, you really don't need to even have a schematic. You don't need to do a schematic circuit core simulation and all those things. You can directly get results from the momentum simulation. Now, once the pairing is done, let's close the port editor. We can open the EM setup and now we can set up our simulation. So we will use momentum microwave. And then in the substrate, instead of using the FEM substrate, I'm going to use this substrate one, which has an ideal cover plate on the for the crown. Uh, the port editor is already being updated and the frequency I would like to simulate is from one to five gigahertz. Output plan remains the same. Now, another trick which you need to learn when you deal with these kind of structures is basically to come up with the right methods so that you don't end up um, you know, using too much of RAM and simulation time. Now, because the things with micro strip lines are pretty straightforward, now you have this big crown plane to worry about and also a lot of these via holes to worry about. And if you're using finite crown conductor on layer number two, you will have even more conductors. And as you know, in EM simulation, more conductor volume you have to solve, more memory and time you need to need. So here you will need. So here is the trick which you can help you to do the job as efficiently as possible. So under physical model in options, I'm going to define the via to be wire type, which will give me the desired accuracy as it will compute the DC resistance and the skin effect along with wire self-inductance and mutual wire to wire inductance, etc. Because all the vias used here are for grounding purpose. So wire model is more than sufficient to capture the accurate performance. The second thing under meshing, the global definition, you can see you are in a global tab, is 20 cells per wavelength. But large part of my circuit is a ground net. And ground net doesn't need to be meshed with such high density of 20 or 30 or 40 cells sometime, which you might need to use in your signal lines. So under meshing, we can go to net specific. And if you look at all the net names here, they are all belonging to different sections in your design. For example, once you click some of these nets, you can see which section is basically referring to. So if you are dealing with some of these design, you can set the meshing per net. Wherever you expect more uh, current concentration to be, you can set it to higher. But in my case, if I look at the crown conductor, I don't want to mesh it with 20 cells per wavelength. I can live with only 10 cells per wavelength. And that's what I'm going to uh, do in my design. All right, so with these two settings, your job will be for the simplified, we'll save the setup, and we will go ahead and simulate our design. It will take few seconds. Now, while it is simulating, let me give you some other tips here. Now, sometime a net specific mode is very useful because not only you can set shells per wavelength uh, per net, you can also select whether on a specific net you would like to switch on H mesh. And if you want to do so, you can go ahead and select it to be auto determine. And that way you can completely customize how much memory and RAM is uh, being used to simulate these kind of complex structure. They'll be very helpful for you if you're dealing with Kerber files when you're importing or DXF file, which you might be importing to run simulation. Now, as you can see, it doesn't take too long for momentum simulation to run. And in one shot, you have your result exactly as you calculated, where you have the desired 20 dB S11 bandwidth around the frequency zone you are looking at. Also, if you compare transmission of S21 and S31, they have a pretty decent response around 0. 0.2 dB, uh, kind of assumption loss over uh, minus 3 dB, which you will anyway get from a two-way power divider. Uh, the S22 looks pretty good. S33 looks pretty good. Also, the isolation S32 is also very nice, better than 20 dB in the frequency range we are designing for. And you can ignore all these um, fourth uh, term 
because they belong to the resistor port in our design. All right, so you saw how simple it is and how straightforward it is to do a CPWG baseline. Now, another variant you might need to, you know, think about, and sometime I have seen people, you know, trying to play with, oh, this section I'm going to design with some other ground separation. This section I'm going to design with some other ground separation. Don't try to do that. Keep things as simple as you can. Your design life will be much easier. Don't overcomplicate the design. Now, some might argue in some cases, it is not possible to do what I'm you know, trying to do. Well, in this case, if there is absolutely no other option, then you can play with ground variation. But as long as you can keep things consistent, you will make your own life easy. Now, another question which sometimes comes is, okay, what if I need to change the width of this line? It's too difficult to maintain the ground distance and all that. Well, let me show you they are not difficult at all. For example, if I double click this trace and if I need to change the width to 1 mm. Now, once I change the width to a 1 mm, you can see the ground separation is no longer followed. Well, not a problem. Just right click on the ground, say regenerate the plane. And you see the ground is readjusted uh, with the 0.5 uh, mm distance as we wanted. Now, let me undo that. Another thing which you could do is sometimes is if you ch need to change the length of this trace to fine tune a certain you know amount of results which you want. For example, I might shift this trace like that and now you can see I'm actually overlapping with the crown and you can see there is a big overlap area. Not to worry again, simply right click on the ground plane, regenerate the plane and now if you click on this trace here, it's now 17 mm. Remember earlier it was 18 mm, but everything gets reconfigured automatically. And this the this the benefit you get by keeping a consistent ground separation uh, for your designs and not overdoing things. So always think a little bit outside the box. Is it really necessary to do that or not? And it will go a long way in making your design phase much, much simpler. Now the second variation here, you can see in my design, I have used a metered corner. Uh, some people prefer to use a curved corner. Well, I'm not a big fan, but in case you want to do that, you can double click on this trace and you can see the corner type is meter and I can change it to curve, define the curve radius and I can give it a two mm curve radius. And let me do that uh, for all the nets uh, which I have here, or all the traces which I have here. And now suddenly you can see the whole design is kind of messed up because the ground plane is not following exactly what you did. Well, again, just simply right click, regenerate the plane and voila, you have your modified design with the curved corners instead of using a metered corner. Now you can go ahead and run a EM simulation again and compare the performance between the metered corner or the curved corner and you can pick what you need. While you are doing this modification, the only thing you need to worry about or take care of is basically this via holes because sometimes the via holes have to be adjusted a little bit, but that's not a big deal considering if you have to redo all of this again. All right, so with that, we finished the first part of this video. Now quickly, in another 10 minutes or so, I would like to talk about the rest of the three um, action items we have for this video. Now, few people commented on my last video is to educate them about how do I find the impedance for these multi-section power divider design? Because last time I just uh, used it to design multi-section, but I didn't uh, provide the relevant information on how do I calculate this? Well, here is your answer. So I use Keysight Genesis software. This is a pretty cool software with a lot of synthesis technologies available. Not only, only passive circuit synthesis, you can also do active circuits such as mixer, oscillator, and so on. So in this case, I will use a signal control, which basically has the power divider, coupler, and those kind of synthesis programs. And here you can see you have various type of splitters, couplers, balloon, attenuator, and so on. And you also have different types of uh, splitters you can design. So if you're dealing with classical uh, one section uh, power divider, you can look at it is giving you the right number as you wanted. Now, if you need a multi-section power divider, simply go to settings. You can define number of sections you need. And if I change the number of section to two, 
as soon as I do, uh, you know, click on two, you can see there's a two section power divider and you have your impedance of around 84 ohm and 59 ohm for first and second section. And similarly, like last time I did with three sections. And if you remember still, uh, we use first section as 90 ohm, second section as 70.7 ohm, and the third section with 56.1 ohm. And now once you have this number, you can go back to ADS, use line calc, depending upon the substrate material you are using, and that's it. You are ready for your design. And also the resistor information uh, for all the sections is shown here, and you can get that information very easily looking at it, uh, around 60 ohm, 79 ohm, and 200 ohm. All right, so with this, and you can feel free to explore Genesis, download Genesis installer from Keyside website, apply for the evaluation license, and you can give it a try for 30 days. Lot of lot of cool stuff inside Genesis for you to try. As a standalone software, you have the layout, you have momentum, everything if you prefer to use Genesis for your work. All right, so with this knowledge, I told you the secret how I do my three section design or multi section design here. And in this case, I already have the three section CPWD design. Uh, and you know, with all the techniques I just showed you exactly, you just need to do it for three times for three sections. Now, if I click on first line, you can see uh, the width of that section is around 0.3, 18 mm long, which is for the calculation I did the line calc for 90 ohm section. 70.7 ohm section, which we just use, is 0 0.6, 18 mm long, and 56 ohm section is 1 mm and around 18 mm long, and finally 250 ohm lines. I put the ground connected GSG configuration and simulated this design. And here is the result for three section power divider built on a CPWG. And you can see in a broadband of two gigahertz around the center frequency of 2.5, which is around an octave bandwidth, you have the pretty decent looking response in all aspects again. No schematic, no circuit EM co simulation, no hassles. Plain layout design is doing the job, which I am looking to do. All right, so let's go back to agenda. And uh, we already covered the multi section CPWG. And, um, you know, if you're not clear about the three section, refer to my video number one, repeat some of the steps, and with one or two iterations, you will get there. And then you will yourself realize how easy it is to do it for your own specifications. All right, finally, for completion's sake, well, although I'm not going to talk about this uh, topic in great detail in this video, but I promise there will be another video in near future where I'm going to show you how to bring in all these kind of 3D models and then do a full assembly level simulation. But let me show you the glimpse of what you can expect. And if you really want to do it today, you can always do that. In this design, I used the, the substrate, you know, I showed you earlier, where I do have two layers mounted, and this could be top two layers of eight layer or six layer uh, technology, which you might be using. And in those two layers, I'm constructing my RF circuit, which is this design, and I have a bounding area layer defined to limit the size of the dielectric. Because remember, whenever you do any 3D simulation, you've got to have a finite size of the problem or the dielectric has to be of finite size. So if I go back to my layout, you can see I do have um, a 3D model shown here. On top side, you have the corn layer. On bottom side, you have corn two, which is a solid crown. And then you have tons of via holes shorting the top and the bottom crown. And here I do have few SMA connector models and these SMA connector models were created using EM Pro like I showed in one of the earlier videos. So this SMA connector model I created myself, but in case you're working with a vendor who is giving you a 3D CAD file, you can import that CAD file into EM Pro, assign the material as he is providing you the information with and that imported or created geometry you can use in uh, ADS for full assembly level simulation. You can see in this SMA connector, I do have one port 
which I have attached on the face of the SMA connector. And once you have that, I have simply added that as a library into my ADS workspace. And as you can see, so this is the workspace I'm looking at or the directory. And that directory has plenty of 3D models, uh, such as this air core inductor, a multi-layer capacitor, which I all uh, created myself uh, for various applications. Now, once I have this full assembly design, I can invoke RF Pro and or you can even do it with a classical EM setup, which you use for momentum or running FEM. I prefer doing it in RF Pro because I have more flexibility. So in RF Pro, you can see the complete assembly level design. And under the EM setup, if you refer to the ports, all the 3D components which you bring in uh, from EM Pro, they all have the port you know, specification or the port location which we used and attached in EM Pro. Using that, I simply dragged and dropped them to create a port. And you can see all faces have a waveguide port and I do have a 100 ohm resistor pretty much like how I did into the EM setup. And here you can see all the waveguide ports are defined as TML, feed type, which is basically waveguide. And here uh, for resistor, I have a 100 ohm uh, you know, connected there. Now, once we simulate this design, here is the response. You can see the S21 and S31 is around 3.1 dB, which is pretty much how what we achieved uh, for a PCB alone. And here is your S11 and the isolation plot. And around my desired frequency band, you can see I have better than minus 20 dB. So now I have increased confidence that after I fabricate this PCB, I put the SMA connector, my assembly will definitely give me the response I'm looking at. So you might be thinking how much simulation time I do really require, what kind of memory I really require for this kind of simulation. So if you look at my simulation results, I only took around two GB of RAM to simulate this kind of a structure. And it took me around 10 minutes on my laptop to simulate. So that's how cool it is I'm using the RF Pro with a new generation FEM solver inside to simulate these kind of complex structure with great ease. All right, my friends, with this, I have covered all the agenda points uh, for which we wanted to discuss in this tutorial. I hope all the content presented will be useful for your work. And now your life will be much simpler when you deal with CPWG kind of structures inside ADS. And again, remember, don't use brute force method. Whenever you're faced with a problem, step back, think what are the ways to accomplish the same task and think about simplifying your design flow. And as long as you can manage it, your design life will be as simple as it gets. Thanks a lot for watching this tutorial and staying till the end. Wish you all the best in your design work. Happy designing.